Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, our webinar series. Uh, today we're talking about garment prescription and design. Uh, with us is uh, Rosemary Kendall, our clinical advisor based in WA, as well as Veronica Eichmann, our clinical advisor based in New Zealand. Uh, so with that, oh, sorry, uh, my name is Adam Ho. I'm the managing director of JobSkin. Uh, and with that, I'll leave it to Rosemary to kick off. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us uh, this afternoon. Um, oh, I think it's, yeah, it's afternoon for everybody now. <laughs> um, as Adam said, uh, I'm in WA and uh, so I'm lagging behind the rest of you, I would say. So this afternoon, what we're going to do is we're going to try and unpack in a little bit more detail the information of um, the information that you need to take into account when you're prescribing garments, because ultimately that then determines the design of the garment. Um, and hopefully this will just help you tweak the processes that you use. Um, uh, I'm sure um, most of you are experienced, but I have to say for me, I, I've been working with garments for many years and I, I still learn every, probably not every garment, but um, each time I make a change to a garment, I learn from that. So hopefully we'll be able to share some ideas that will be useful to you. So we're going to just do a bit of a refresher at the start because I can't, we can't really assume um, how much you each know. So please, if you're, if this is kind of familiar territory to you, please bear with us. We'll try and kind of move through it fairly quickly. We're going to look at screening for co comorbidities, basic garment prescription, the key factors that we need to take into account in garment prescription, both for, well, for a range of clinical indications. And then we're going to look at some of the design and fitting challenges and ways that you can tweak um, your garment design. Um, and then we're kind of just going to pull it all together at the end. So um, uh, in summary, um, what are the things that make a garment a good choice? Uh, well, there's a few key things. Obviously, it's got to be necessary um, for whatever the clinical indication you're choosing. Uh, it needs to be, um, and actually, I say that because I do see people who um, wear garments because, you know, just in case. Um, and, uh, you know, so we, we need to kind of be clear about why we're prescribing garments. It needs to be therapeutic beneficial obviously it needs to provide the compression where it needs to um, uh, you know and an ill-fitting garment obviously is not going to do that it needs to accommodate a varying range of skin states whether it's very fragile or um, um, areas that are prone to breakdown or where there's um, uh, different wound things going on. Um, it needs to fit well, and obviously it has to be livable. The patient has to be able to kind of do everyday tasks in it. Um, it has to be a garment that actually encourages the patient to wear it. Now that can be from because they are totally committed to the therapeutic effectiveness of the garment, or it can be because if it's something that's a bit more cosmetically appealing, then they don't mind wearing it. It obviously needs to be something that's sufficiently durable that sustains compression. And also, um, it has to be the kind of garment that you get what you want in the garment as a therapist when you're prescribing the garment. So that, that's really what makes a garment a good choice. So um, obviously, um, it's Job Skin that's presenting this webinar for you today. So what? why would you choose a Job Skin garment? There's a few things that I would just kind of highlight for you. So one is, um, the we ensure that our um, garments meet the criteria of graduated compression. We don't have time to review that. If that's unfamiliar to you, you might want to have a look at the uploaded webinar from last month, which was the introduction to compression, which explains that. We really endeavour to keep our seams to a minimum. Uh, I do sometimes see some garments around the traps that have got lots and lots of seaming in them and every seam you put in the garment reduces the compression. Um, there's no sizing restriction. A job skin garment can be made for the, a tiny child to a super morbidly obese adult. There's obviously different things that have to be accommodated in that, but um, that is quite possible. There's 
endless options and modifications, um, which means that it's the garment can be fully customizable. That includes linings or where you put the seams or how you modify the style or um, how you can modify the garment to make it easier to get on and off or to go to the toilet. Um, and there's lots of colours and styles to accommodate preferences. And you'll see that we've got quite a few sample garments um, that are on display through this webinar, and you'll see that that will be highlighted as we go. Um, and there's no charge levied for first fit alterations. So if you order um, a custom made garment and then it doesn't fit properly, you can return it, we will alter it. Um, we obviously need information from you to do that and there will be no charge in incurred in that. Uh, I mean, obviously, if you're returning a garment four months down the track, that's a different um, ball game, but uh, we certainly want to ensure that the garment is right at the start. Now, just a quick uh, sort of overview of the things that we need to take into account. And my observation of therapists around the trap, and this is no disrespect to anybody, um, but generally therapists working in the area of edema and lymphedema are very finely tuned to some of the comorbidities, partly because that's it's, it's part and parcel of the uh, package of the presenting patient. I think sometimes with burns and scarring where we often have a younger cohort um, and there's so much focus on getting the scarring under control that some of these things can be overlooked. So it's good practice to screen every patient for comorbidities before you prescribe compression. So do they have congestive cardiac failure? If they do, they're unfit for compression without uh, cardiology assessment. Um, does the patient have other cardiac problems? Uh, in which case um, it needs to be cleared with medical staff. I've just got an example here that might kind of bring the value of this to life. I, I was presenting to a group of vascular surgeons and registrars and talking about compression. And I spoke about the fact that um, you'll see on a subsequent slide that we would view CCF as a contraindication. And at the end of uh, my presentation, one of the senior registrars put his hand up and said, you know, why, why don't you provide compression when someone has CCF? I do it all the time. And I kind of thought, oh, I feel like this is maybe a bit of a trick question because I thought it was pretty obvious that if you increase the pressure distally, then you, no, sorry, if you compress distally, you in, in increase fluid flow to the heart. And um, I didn't say that. I sort of I have to say, I think I stumbled a bit and I thought, I said, well, oh, well, um, you know, well, and I gave my explanation and uh, he said, oh, I never thought of that. Now, you know, he's a highly intelligent, proficient person, but I think that's a good example about how we get focused on the problem that we want to solve and not take some of the other factors into account. In this particular circumstance, um, the clinical nurse consultant was also there and she tapped him on the shoulder and said, oh, look, whenever you do that, we always send them down to cardiology for a screen <laughs> beforehand. But, you know, I think it, it it's a good reminder for us. So the other thing to cons another thing to consider is whether the patient's diabetic. If it's purely diabetic, document it and proceed. Um, if they, we, but you do then to need ask the question, do they have a peripheral neuropathy? And if so, then, uh, you need to um, assess whether they are fit for compression. If they are patients that are known to be in the, not very good at, at um, caring for their foot health and they've, you know, had multiple instances of where their foot health has been compromised, you know, burns on hot concrete or untended lacerations or, you know, the whole range of break, skin breakdown that's gone unnoticed, then compression should be avoided, that's fairly obvious. And then the last question is really whether the patient has vascular disease, if they have an arterial insufficiency, whether they have venous disease, and we'll just talk about that a little bit more on the next page, because we consider if somebody has their ABPI done, that's their ankle brachio pressure index, that's an assessment of the um, adequacy of their arterial function. If they have an ABPI of 
0.5 to 0.8, normal is 1.0, um, then we we can still proceed with compression, but we need to go we need to go with caution. So we might use a lower compression, 15 to 20, with an ABPI of 0.5 to 0.8. We'd also we're also cautious when there's renal insufficiency, extreme shape dis distortions of limb and deep skin folds will change our garment pre prescription. It has to be very clearly taken into account. Lymphorrhea, uh, as I said, peripheral neuropathy, pulmonary, pulmonary edema, skin or scar fragility. We don't just go, you know, striding in where angels fear to tread. We just take a little bit more uh, caution. What we would list, uh, advise you as contraindications are CCF, as I've said, um, severe arterial, arterial insufficiency. So if their ABPI is under 0.5, then uh, it's not wise to apply compression. And just as a little aside, if it's over 1.2, um, you may question the value of the compression because particularly for vascular indications, it's less effective. Um, also, if there's cutaneous infections or exudative dermatitis or bulky dressings, we generally don't apply compression. So what do you need to take into account when you're prescribing a garment? Um, two main clinical groups um, generally access compression. There is a third clinical group we could include where um, people say in with hypermobility spectrum disorder, uh, use compression for uh, postural correction and postural support. Um, that will come up through some of these other things, but probably doesn't warrant so much variance in the factors that need to be taken into account. So the two main groups, burns and scarring, vascular edema and lymphedema. So for burns and scarring, we need to assess whether there is edema. We'll talk, we'll talk more about each of these. The skin state, the risk of scarring, the degree of hypertrophy, the environmental factors, whether the patient can get the garment on and off, whether they're likely to comply, um, and what sort of design do we need? Now, most of those things Certainly the environmental factors, uh, independence with donning and doffing, compliance design, um, that's all taken into account for vascular and edema, but there's a couple of very significant differences. One is changes in limb proportion have to be specifically taken into account. And also the clinical prescription um, must take into account the way a garment is constructed because for some patients with vascular edema and lymphedema, Unquestionably, Job skin's your best choice. But there are some where I would say to you, actually, I think it's contraindicated. You need to go to a different kind of garment. But hopefully you'll get a sense of that as we go through this webinar. So let's, we're, going, we're trying to accommodate both those groups. So we're going to chop and change a bit between burns, um, scarring, and then lymphedema and edema and vascular but also there's a number of factors that are common to both. So we're just going to list a whole lot, but just before we get into that basic prescription for burns and uh, skin grafted tissue is whether the injury has healed within 14 days without surgery. So this is in the case of a burn. If it has, we generally don't warrant, uh, compression's not warranted. Um, if it hasn't, has that um, injury required uh, surgery and if so what kind so if they haven't healed if they haven't required surgery but healing has been prolonged more than 21 days generally they would benefit from compression if it's 14 to 21 then some of those other risk factors which we'll unpack a bit more in the compression for scar management module um, that will um, uh, that needs to be taken into account now some units around Australia use resell or cell spray or some people call it spray on skin. It's actually spray on skin cells. Um, if cell spray has been the uh, the surgical intervention of choice, this is determined a little bit by protocol, but also by time to healing as to whether compression is warranted at all. But if the patient has had skin graft, yes, they need garments. Yes, most likely they need custom garments. And depending on whether it's for a single site or for larger areas of the body, you're going to prescribe the garment based on that. So let's talk a bit about edema, first of all, because that's kind of like one of our, it's almost like a screening 
um, assessment for some of our patients. Um, so if acute edema is present wherever possible, um, we need to postpone measuring. Um, in sort of unusual circumstances, you might want to consider a mirror measure if somebody is reasonably symmetrical or even better if they are very symmetrical. Um, and we're talking about pre-morbid measures. So uh, if somebody is, let's say they're returning to a regional area, you didn't get the opportunity to measure them preoperatively, um, and but they're going to need the compression, you could consider a mirror measure. Best, pa best practice would not be to do a mirror measure, but sometimes there are sort of e extenuating circumstances. If edema is present, ideally the limb volume needs to be stabilised. So whether that's with an interim garment or short stretch bandaging or um, um, yeah, straight simple coban, they are all things that can be considered. But if, um, if edema is persistent and you have to proceed with your garment, then just make sure you choose the correct fabric choice. And we're going to talk a bit about that um, under diff different uh, prescription guidelines. And if the edema is persistent, then they need to be assessed for lymphedema and make the, that um, prescription accordingly. Um, the construction of the garment uh, becomes more of a factor when we're looking at things like edema and lymphedema. And speaking of garment construction, um, the reality is that where um, certainly lymphedema, but where there is uh, some uh, edema, vascular edema, um, the uh, the construction of the garment has to be taken into account. I must say, in my clinical practice, I see a lot of people that are inappropriately put in circular knit garments, not necessarily by a therapist. I'm not having a go at anyone, um, but. Sometimes people go, I've got puffy legs, and so they take themselves off to the chemist and they get a ready-to-wear circular knit garment and somebody very lovely will have sized them for it and it might be the right fit, but it's not the right construction. Uh, and I, I'm sure this is familiar to most of you, so I won't uh, uh, bang on about this too much. But the circular knit one, the reason there's a French knitting spool there, those of you who might remember someone in the playground doing this at primary school, um, you may remember that as the thread is, is um, uh, as the thread is tightened when it's knitted, um, excuse me, just a minute. Um, I just got a lunch delivery, which was very kind. <laughs> um, uh, when the thread is pulled tight, the tube coming out the bottom is um, narrow. When the thread is loose, then the thread coming out the bottom is um, uh, wider. Now that's really, in a nutshell, how a ready-to-wear circular knit garment is made. It's just like a giant commercial French knitting machine. But why am I talking about that? The reason I'm talking about it is because um, because it is knitted with one single thread, so to speak, elastic thread that is continuous, when you cut that material, it curls. And that is an indicator of the fact that there is a risk of tourniquet with those kinds of garments. And so um, they are contraindicated for somebody who's got shape distortions or where there's, say, like a marked anterior ankle crease um, or in the uh, wrist, elbow, if there's significant changes of proportion, um, then that this, this garment becomes uh, risk representative, so best left alone. The next category here is a flat knit garment, and any of you working in edema and lymphedema would be very well aware of uh, these garments because they're kind of uh, oftentimes your go-to garment. These are constructed completely differently. They are knitted to a patient's measurements and then there is a single seam down the back of a sock or an arm sleeve. Uh, sometimes the gloves can even be seamless. But the measuring system is completely different and is a combination of body measures and maximum tension. They are a much stiffer fabric, so they hold the shape. So they can kind of contour a limb that is 
disproportionate or misshapen and can ride over those creased and lobular areas. So then the third kind is what we call a cut and sew garment and Jove skin is representative of this. So um, this is uh, uh, the measurements are taken, their body measures quite, it's a comprehensive measuring system. And then our designers design the pattern much as um, a, you know, a shirt or a dress is designed uh, and cut out, but of course to much higher specs and much more complex. And, um, and then it is made to fit as a, as a body fit. There's countless options and modifications, as I mentioned earlier, and um, it does mean that it's uh, very modifiable to meet specific requirements. There's lots of colours too, uh, which I think we'll, you'll see as we go. Now, the, the next thing to accommodate is the actual skin state. So is the skin fragile and prone to breakdown? Because potentially abrasive fab fabrics, they might provide awesome compression when they're on, but actually the act of donning and doffing. Um, and any of you have worked with a patient who's had a venous leg ulcer will fully understand just how um, fragile that balance is between providing adequate compression and ensuring that um, the skin uh, skin is not damaged in any way and risk re-ulceration. So you might need to consider your fabric choice or consider linings. Um, the uh, We have a fabric called CDA, which is not available as a whole garment option, but where you have trouble spots, it's a good, um, can be used as a lining or reinforcement, or maybe specific panels can be replaced with CDA, but that's something that you would need to speak to Veronica and I about, or even better to speak to Anne-Marie, Ellen, or Catalan, our awesome de design team. You might wanna consider the construction too, Venus leg ulcers are a good example, actually, because putting in gussets, moving seaming or adding in zips or linings might be all that it takes. You can still use that same strong power net fabric to get the compression, but you can alleviate some of those uh, stresses. Um, you might also need to consider whether the, the um, garment needs to accommodate ongoing um, dressings that might affect the sizing or the design or actually how a garment can be donned uh, when there are dressings in place. I find myself saying many, many times to patients, you need to put it on this way or otherwise you're just gonna roll the dressings all the way up your leg. So um, sometimes actually making those changes uh, to the garment design. So cutting holes, putting in garments, adding linings, moving zips, reshaping the garment can avoid um, pressure points uh, and protect friable skin. So um, I did uh, did say earlier that bulky dressings we tend to avoid. There are some extenuating circumstances where garments might go on over bulky dressings. Low profile is definitely a better option. Um, and sometimes you may need to negotiate with nursing staff who are applying wound dressings to modify the garments design to accommodate those dressings. Okay, on to the risk of scarring. Um, because when someone has an elevated scarring risk, you might need to modify their regime. Sometimes you might need to make it more cautious if that means that by um, that uh, elevated risk of scarring is also accompanied by a risk of breakdown, or sometimes you need to go a bit more aggressive. You might need to increase pressure, um, and we'll talk a little bit later so that I don't double up. I think I double up a little bit on the last webinar in a couple of these. Um, we'll talk about how you can increase the pressure, and you might want to then add lining as well as increasing the pressure so that you are being more cautious and more aggressive. Um, and uh, I, I feel like I say this a lot in my working life, um, but we need to do whatever it takes to elicit compliance or adherence to our regime because the success of a garment is only possible if a patient wear, wears it and if they hate the look of it or it's the wrong colour or it's uncomfortable or it's... Um, 
there's an irritation point on it, then um, it's pointless. Um, and so um, a compromise garment is better than none at all. I, I gave an example in the last run of this webinar of a, a patient I've seen recently. He has an increased scarring risk because he's Asian. He's a chef and he was carrying a pot of boiling hot oil and he slipped and the oil, he tipped the oil the top of his chest but also onto his face. Now, facial scarring is always that bit more confronting for um, wearing compression. And he was offered an acrylic face mask, which he wasn't willing to wear. He was offered a fabric face mask he wasn't willing to wear. And he also said his boss uh, wouldn't let him wear it at work. Um, he, while he was injured at work, he had two jobs and it was the boss in the other job that was saying you can't wear that to work. So he was just not going to wear anything at all, but increased scarring risk, significant scarring risk, actually. Uh, we needed to do something. So we thought outside the box and he's been put into a sort of a wide headband that goes from about his eyebrow height up to his hairline um, with Cylon Tex lining, which we're going to talk about in a minute. And um, that means he wears this tight headband. It's black, um, which was the choice that we settled on together when he was saying, we, I was sort of finding out from him what would work well at work, what was his uniform like, what would his boss agree to. So we came up with a black power net headband lined with Cylon Tex. I'll explain in a sec. Um, and he was really happy with that. And, you know, made me choke a little bit because really what he needed was a full face mask. But I totally get that it doesn't matter how good a face mask is. If it's not going on his head, it's of no value whatsoever. Um, so a compromised garment's better than none at all. Now, I mentioned Cylon Tex a couple of times. This is a half a mil thick. It's a silicon lining um, and um, uh, and it can be stitched into the garment so that it's a very user-friendly way to use silicon for scarring. Um, it's, uh, I, can I just say straight up, we've got some information on Cylon Tex and some brochures that we'd be happy to send you. You could never fully line a garment Cylon because you would never get it on because it has got a slightly clammy texture so it doesn't slide on easily. Um, and also... Um, we would recommend generally that you go no more than 50% of the circumference and probably it would be best to go about 30% of the circumference. But if you've got somebody who you're considering Cylon text with, do let Veronica and I know and we can give you some advice about, you know, in that location and for this length or size, uh, we would suggest X, Y and Z. So, um, we also need to take into account the area concerned because in terms of compression, not all areas are created equal. Compression to limbs is more reliable than torsos. And those of you who've come, who understand graduated compression well, and particularly if you come from the edema lymphedema side of things, you will be very familiar with the law of Laplace. And that that's based on a cylinder. And so um, the compression is calculated based on the cylinder, but limbs are reasonably cylindrical. Um, hands are not, torsos are not. They are really squashed ovals if you look at them as a cross section. Hands particularly. Um, so if you look down at your hand now, you can see that it's like it's a very squashed oval. What that means is you get very good compression on the radial and ulnar border you get less on the dorsum. And if you turn your hand over and just remind yourself how concave a palm is, you get no compression in there. So foam padding can assist. So if you were to put some padding over the dorsum of the hand, then you increase the compression on the dorsum, but you also actually take off the peaking compression from the sides of the hand, because sometimes in a glove, the sides get irritated because the compression is actually too high there. So padding can enable you to target specific areas, but it also evens out the level of compression. 
You can also consider um, modifying garments to ensure that you get the compression where you want it because there are some areas that are very difficult and probably the most difficult is the sternum and we're going to look at that um, a little bit later with some of our examples so that hopefully that will be helpful to you. We also need to consider the degree of hypertrophy and this duplicates a little bit with the scarring risk but where you've got established hypertrophy you've got to put it into a power net garment okay you cannot be using softer silkier you know uh, less resilient fabrics um, power net or power techs even and power techs is the sort of heavier duty version of uh, power net but of course you've got to consider the likelihood of breakdown so you might need to consider linings or alterations um, and garment designs might need to be modified to ensure that you get the compression in that target area and you're probably starting to get a sense about the interplay of some of these prescription factors um, so it might be that we want um, compression in a specific area but we might also want to remove irritants and a really good example of that is the anterior or the anterior ankle crease because if you have the seam right along the ankle crease it's a good fit but for somewhere there's scarring right there it's just absolute irritant and it's going to cause breakdown so you'd be better off doing an ankle gusset which we'll talk about in a little while um, and we've also spoken about Cylon Tex garments I won't repeat myself but the other thing is if you're not using Cylon Tex in your garments then you might want to accommodate gel sheets being fitted into the garment now environmental factors in what environment is the patient going to wear it I did have a patient oh this is a long time ago um, but he needed to wear knee-high socks and he was a miner and he worked up north uh, underground and he said that the average temperature at his work was 54 degrees when he was underground so clearly I'm not going to put anything with lining in it it needs to be as breathable as possible it's a rough working environment so he actually had his garment in power techs because it's more durable and it's a stronger more resilient fabric but now how important is the appearance of the garment probably for a minor uh, in 54 degrees less so but for the example I gave you before of the chef wow. um, clearly the appearance of the garment was very much a stumbling block in his workplace and we do occasionally see people where that um, also happens for for children at school where schools say you can't wear it unless it's school colors but if we kind of tuned into that and asking those questions then before the child's sent home um, or the mum's called in to say they can't wear it to school, mum or dad, um, we can preempt that by checking, you know, is, does the school have a problem or what's your employer likely to think or, you know, is your employer happy with you wearing a hot pink garment with orange seaming or would it be a good idea to get a black one if you work in hospitality, that kind of idea. We need to consider the climactic conditions of the patient's environment. The minor was a very good example about that. But also we can modify the garment to make it cooler. Um, you know, the reality is we live in Australia and New Zealand. New Zealand's, their climactic conditions are probably more so cooler, though of course they have hot temperatures. But um, Northern Queensland and Northern, and Northern Territories and Northern WA, very hot climate. And... Um, uh, so we can modify things to make it cooler, cut out panels where pressure's not required if it just makes it more breathable, put mesh in the uh, crotch or the axilla, lower the necklines if it's possible, avoid linings, there are all ways that we can manage that. Um, and but, but also consider conditions that may affect the garment longevity, that's another environmental factor. You know, kids that are crawling, uh, leather patch on their knees or you know some a tradesman leather patches on their uh, hands or wearing protective gloves over their um, uh, clinical reasoned gloves um, that they're, they're all ways that can help zips too because uh, sometimes if that actually takes the pressure off for donning that then the uh, longevity of the garments improved and speaking of uh, zips and donning and doffing you know, is the patient able to get their garment on and off? Because if they can't, they're not going to wear it. Um, and it might be that you need to consider 
who can come in and help them put them off, or it might be that you need to modify the garment to enable them to be independent. Sometimes that's actually segmenting the garment, like an arm sleeve and a glove rather than a, you know, an all-in-one. Or um, similarly, you can do something similar from the the um, lower part of the body, like capri and knee highs. Or actually, you making a change whether a, a bodysuit is more suitable than, say, bike shorts and vest, or vice versa. And that's something obviously that you need to decide in conjunction with your patient. And will zips help? Well, zips might help, but they also might make donning a whole lot more difficult. Always think about where the zip's gonna go, say in vest, front or back. Um, I have just this week prescribed a garment for somebody who's got skin grafts on their belly. And I had a chat with a designer and together we think that she'll be able to get it on without a zip. Now that means that the garment's going to sit beautifully flat over the grafts because no matter how good the zip, there's often a bit of loss of compression or a little bit of buckling. So we need to kind of consider the therapeutic purpose of the garment and the zip and make a decision about that. Um, will the compression level affect the independence? The reality is the higher the compression, the harder it is to get on. And sometimes a lighter compression or layered compression to, um, to um, garments to achieve the, uh, the required compression might be more manageable. Um, and then one last little practical thing, and uh, you know, I think most of you are therapists and you would just be all over this, but we need to remember hygiene um, and sometimes people can get their garments on but it takes them five to seven minutes and they can't get them off in time to go to the toilet. So then do we need to modify the garment design, whether it's um, layered or open crotch or, uh, you know, a fly front or something to actually make the garment, um, you know, ease or toilet, make toileting far simpler and more straightforward. Then compliance. There's some been some interesting journal articles that have come out that really talk about the fact that compliance is probably the most single powerful factor in the effectiveness of a garment. It makes good sense because as I said earlier it doesn't matter how good the garment is if they don't wear it it's just worth nothing at all and um, there's also been a couple of articles that I've read in the last couple of years about the fact it's really highlighting the value of education. We all know this we're all therapists this is our bread and butter but actually the more that somebody understands why they're wearing a garment and why we've made together these decisions about the design, the more likely they are to sort of adhere to the regime we're su suggesting. Um, other things that affect compliance, um, or well, things that affect compliance are whether the garment's comfortable. So it's got to be good fitting and we need to ensure that it is comfortable that it anchors well, that they're not walking along the street hoiking up their pants or pull it, having to pull up their socks all the time or or their, you know, the arm sleeve is slipping down. Um, all those things, make sure the anchorage is really good. One little practical tip I would give as someone who's worked in compression for a long time is if somebody has a history of non-compliance, and we, we, you all know this, we, can, we can't assume that they're going to be non-compliant but we're also not going to throw good money after bad and so you might want to consider demonstrated compliance through tube grip for a week or two and then a ready to wear for a week or two uh, and then a custom garment at that point if someone's demonstrated their compliance um, and just uh, modifying the appearance of a uh, garment is very powerful for um, compliance this the mannequin that you can see on the screen there is uh, where a garment's been made to resemble active wear not that I think most people are going to walk down the street just in their job skin garments but but if but um, if they're wearing that with a t-shirt or shorts it just kind of looks like uh, or even just with shorts it looks more uh, less noticeable more every day um, you might want to um, offer club colours or you know for a child a red and blue bodysuit if the if mum and dad call it um spider-man then 
the 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 child's on board but if they call it their you know their you know their scar suit or something and it's in beige not quite the same engagement um i've got an example for club colors because um as uh, i mentioned at the start i'm in wa which is uh, a bit of an afl state and i'm a proud docker supporter and their team colors are purple and white so i make my usual kind of lame joke when i'm measuring someone saying oh you know looks really good in purple and white and uh, i get some fairly forceful rejections from eagle supporters but there you go um but i did have one young bloke who said oh that would be awesome you know do you think they'd stitch three white v's on it for me and i said well we can ask um three white v's were stitched on the garment and he was absolutely delighted he wore that everywhere and he wore it out um, and that's what we want, isn't it? We want our patients wearing the garments that they need for the therapeutic purpose. And so the more that we can involve them in the decision making, the better the uh, the better the outcome really. Now, we had problems with this video in the last webinar, so I'm going to skip over it. It eventually played, but we couldn't get the sound. So, but what I would do is I would refer you to uh, the JobSkin website. If you're not familiar with the JobSkin me measuring system, the website is www.jobskin.com. There is no AU. Um, and if you go to um, support, uh, you'll see that there's the how to videos and there is one that's actually runs you through the basic principles for measuring for job skin garments but then there's a whole you know wad of videos for different body parts so even if you are uh, unfamiliar uh, or not confident probably a better term if you've got somebody coming in you can take five minutes because they're brief videos and just refresh what you need to do and uh, that will sort of equip you hopefully for the task um, just sir. As, well, as well, um, um I've just pasted our YouTube, YouTube, YouTube channel in the chat so people can access the videos there as well. Great. Great. Thank you for that, Adam. I nice. didn't think of that. Um, we've also got a range of resources to assist you. Again, they're on the website under the support and training tab. Um, there's uh, these brochures are probably three of our key brochures. There is also a Cylon Text brochure, which I mentioned if you're interested in the Cylon Text. But these three, the the two on the right, the Making Good Garment Great, one's for burns and scarring, one's for edema and lymphedema. That's really an overview of what we're discussing today in the um, factors to take into account for garment prescription. So it's a good resource for you to have. Um, and you can download these off the website or we'd be happy to um, post you a, you know, a printed copy if the photocopier is like, photocopied copy is likely to be less durable. Um, and then on the left, you'll see there is a garment selections and modifications, a guide. This is basically a pictorial um, brochure that runs you through the key garments and then also their standard modifications and options so we're just going to flick through that now um, so for with the options and modifications the main sort of uh, cluster of garments for the head and neck and the face include a chin strap uh, a, a face mask that is open head so you can see there is there's no fabric over the top of the head um, an open face or it can be an open face with closed head or a full face mask. Also for the neck, we have the chin extension collar, which is custom um, sized, obviously, which is wonderful. And then the turtleneck, um, which we're going to talk a bit more about the turtleneck. And then below that, you can see that there's a range of options there. So um, targeted compression across the lip. You might wonder the difference between the, these two. This is a standard face mask here where it's a single piece of fabric that comes up to the nose. And depending on where you want the compression, that might be perfectly adequate. Um, I have to say, me, myself, I, I'm a big fan of the nose contouring. And what you can see is that the, this, the background fabric of the face mask has got a triangle cut in it, uh, a little bit like you see there except that or oh, and here except that it's then got an insert stitched into it my tip about this is that it gets much better compression down onto the cheeks close to the nose whereas this fabric tends to tend a bit so depending on what you want 
um, you too can choose one or the other. You can get the eyes reinforced, the ears reinforced, you can get the ears enclosed or an eye enclosed, like particularly with facial edema, that might be useful. For um, garments for the body, like for the torso, uh, there's a range of vests, varying lengths, short sleeve, long sleeve, sleeveless, there's the Adonis variation here, which we'll talk a little bit about as we go on. The lymph crop vest, which is designed specifically for breast edema and chest wall edema. A modified vest, um, that, that's probably a more extreme modification. Then we've got the sternal strap, we'll talk about that later. Body suit, uh, which can be uh, to knee length or full length. Um, so that's an all-in-one garment. And like I said earlier, you can decide is a bodysuit better or a vest and bike shorts. So these, the panty girdle is the bike shorts, uh, panty brief, uh, scrotal support. Um, and then of course, for the legs, varying lengths and it doesn't have to be the same on both legs. So lots of modifications available. There's more torso modifications and options. So you can have bra cups or you can have a contoured breast or a princess line. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the axilla um, uh, when we go a little bit further in this uh, webinar. For You can have a mastectomy pouch for people that um, need to include a prosthesis. There's different necklines, so the funnel neck or the turtle neck, you can have shoulder bracing. And then there's varying openings for uh, children and particularly and toileting options, so a snap lock uh, closure for a body brief or a velcro closure there's nappy straps for children and then you can have uh, a range of openings for at the crotch it could be open crotch uh, a fly um, there can be a gusset uh, a children's open crotch is crotch is better for children who are probably not quite so onto the toileting hygiene they're not quite so proficient can be openings um, cut into the garment for ostomies, uplift reinforcement panels, a range of postural supports. We'll talk a little bit about that. A maternity panel can be inserted. So there's a whole range of things that we can do. For below knee garments, um, there's range of different lengths, anklets, toe pieces, and combinations of the two. So um, a thong toe, which is like a Japanese toe sock, um, toe anklets, toe pieces, a sling back for the toe piece. And then we spoke a bit about the anterior ankle gusset, uh, which you can see in these. You can have a self-enclosed toe, which is all one fabric, or you can have a soft enclosed toe that we'll talk a bit about later. Okay. And then for the upper limb, also endless ranges of options. Anchorage options for an arm sleeve. What I would just highlight is if you do opt for the arm sleeve with a bra loop, you have to have a very firm bra because otherwise what that will do is pull the bra loop, the bra strap down rather than the arm sleeve up. Varying lengths of garments, gloves or gauntlets or um, what we call an interdigital web spacer, which is basically a long gauntlet with anchoring through the web spaces. Um, and varying grips are available. And then also you can have the choice between standard inserts or slant inserts and slant inserts hug the web space better uh, because um, our web spaces slope down towards the dorsum of the hand. Little um, tidbit of extra information I put in there. If you are providing garments to deal with um, web space scarring, you need to put the slant inserts in before that hypertrophy develops. Otherwise, what happens is the, gum, the glove gets pushed up the fingers. So this is a good, good prophylactically, but after it's established, you need to, it, it, it will be less effective. If you're doing it for edema, uh, you can, the edema can be present and you can still prescribe uh, slant inserts. And then just a few closure and anchorage options. You can use silicon backed elastic is awesome for um, uh, helping with anchorage. And then in terms of um, closures, a zip or Velcro, you can have protective uh, covering. 
particularly over sensitive areas or where hairs like to get caught. Um, you can have padding under the zips and a zip loop helps to pull it up, but we'll see that in our case study towards the end. Range of kind of um, aesthetic things, like I mentioned the Spider-Man suit uh, or the, uh, this is like a invented superhero suit or motifs that um, can be, you know, a chuff if the kids into school buses, then a school bus motif, or they'll be happy to come to wear their garment most of the time. There's a range of different paddings and a range of different linings. So what are the particularly challenging areas of the body to prescribe, measure and fit garments? Uh, there's, but bodies are complicated and you, we all know this, different sizes, different shapes. Um, so uh, let, we're going to work through some of those areas. So let, we're going to start at the top basically and work down. So face, head, neck, jawline. Um, look, I, I think people generally feel quite intimidated about measuring for face masks, but let me reassure you, it's simple and it's systematic and the video will certainly help you if you need to do that. Um, and the me I'm referring to the measuring video. But with that range of options and modifications that <coughs> I outlined, I think you'll find that there's lots of options to get good targeted compression. But a couple of sort of tips that I want to give you. Um, we've already spoken about the nose contouring option, option if you need compression around on the cheeks or if you need it on the sides of the nose that's a really good way to do that uh, one thing i would highlight is that the a face when you order a face mask um, it generally comes without the ear holes cut um, for a couple of reasons sometimes people need to try it before they make a decision whether they will have the ear holes cut or not but the other reason is that uh, the way that a face mask sits on a head, it's almost impossible to predict exactly how that fabric's going to stretch. We know the tension that's required, we know how to get a good fit, but with the complexity of the eyes, the nose and the mouth as apertures, it's like adding in the ears is just one too many variables. So we generally supply a face mask without the ears cut and then you mark, uh, I think hopefully you can still see me, I'm not sure if I'm on camera or not, because um, I can't see on the screen, but you mark from where the top, where the ear anchors to the um, head and the bottom of where it anchors. Mark top and bottom right there and then a um, you return the garment, the ear holes will be cut and then return back to you just by return post. A couple of other tricky areas. <clears throat> One is fit on the neck. Some people find sort of seeming, this is fairly loose, this is a power net um, neck part of the garment so it's reasonably soft but some people just find the seaming a little bit choky um, and also sometimes the it's it, the anchorage is not quite as effective because there is a little bit more movement in it I am a big fan of the elastic turtleneck so this is five centimeter wide elastic that is stitched in at this part of the garment here um, and so if it's measured correctly, like not too tight, it feels a little bit like uh, a little bit like a skivvy um, and it's a little bit huggy around the neck rather than choky where a line of stitching is in. Um, but the real plus is that it's very secure anchorage. Now you might be wondering why I've got this image here off to the right. Um, this particular patient who's given consent for this image to be used was um, had a burn and was absolutely, absolutely determined to get a good square jawline. And, and anyone who's worked in burns and scarring will know that burns on the anterior neck are very difficult to manage because the scar's wanting to tighten the shortest point and so that rounds off the point of the chin and also the throat angle at the top of the, the neck before the jaw. Um, so we devised something a little bit different where she wore her face mask during the day and then at night she slept with a chin strap. So she had targeted compression and you can see this is a good example of actually targeted compression. We wanted the line of pull 
coming up here from the throat angle up to the crown so that she could get that real pull in that direction. She, in fact, ended up with a completely awesome jawline, actually. Um, and I have to give her credit for driving that, you know, together we really worked to find a solution because she was very committed to getting a good cosmetic result, as she should be. Now, another tricky area, uh, basically the chest, um, breast, sternum, decolletage. Um, the, this particular slide is about the breast and the sternum. This is an example of the lymph crop vest, but I think it shows um, well how we can shape around the breast. So and still get um, have an indent in the between uh, the breasts over the sternum. And I think oftentimes, you know, those of you who are familiar with sports bras will know that you actually you get for many sports bra designs you don't get any compression in the middle. Um, and for us providing therapeutic compression, if we needed around the breast, we really are aiming for that. So with the bra cup um, added into a vest, you can get actually very good shaping. Um, an alternative to get sternal compression is a sternal strap, which can be um, worn underneath another garment like this red one would be, or it can also be um, uh, stitched into the garment. If I flick back here, you can just see, can you see that black shadow there? This particular person was also had a sternal strap stitched into their bodysuit, and so they're wearing that underneath. So it was like a, a layered sternal strap underneath the, the garment. Um, then uh, apologies, I've there's a typo here. It says turtleneck and princess line. It actually should say bra, cup and princess line. That's my mistake. Um, and uh, here uh, you can see the difference between the two styles of vest design. If you just standardly order a vest, you will have something that will come with this sort of seaming. Um, it's a streamlined one. It's I, I liken it to like a rash vest, a female rash vest, how it's shaped. So it's a little bit wider over the breasts, but essentially it's, got one seaming that goes down the middle. If you need shaped compression, uh, then you need to opt for the bra cup, like you can see on the left. Um, with the princess line, someone could wear, if if their bra, uh, if it's suitable, clinically suitable for them to wear a bra, they can wear a bra underneath that or, or not, um, depending on what you and your patient decide together. For when we focus more on the decolletage, so this upper area of the chest. The Adonis design garment provides an option here if you need compression sort of more up this area. And uh, also uh, on the uh, shoulders. The reason this is cut out here, this is called the Adonis vest. It's cut out so that it, um, it still needs the compression and the anchorage, but actually we don't need fabric all the way down. And in fact, if you can take some of the fabric out, it's great because someone can lift their arms up and you can picture that 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 silicon backed elastic under the material there would actually hold quite firmly. But as they lift up that sort of that hole, for want of a better term, just opens slightly wider. Um, so it allows free movement without that irritation of like a vest riding up. The, the other way to avoid that is to make the vest longer. Um, but this is also a good option for keeping a garment as cool as possible in hot climates. Now, another one I wanted to talk about, another thing I want to talk about with the decolletage is this is kind of one of those little tweaks that when you have this in your toolbox, uh, you're pretty good actually. <laughs> so this is a funnel neck and you can see even from the shaping of the seams, you see how this is just a little bit more curvy and you can imagine that there's actually not great compression around this area. And for some clinical indications, that's totally fine. But if you want good compression here, you're better off going to the turtleneck. And you can see how it's just more squared off like this. Now, this is the little trick for your toolbox. If you lengthen that and lower that so that the seam sits around here, then you'll get an even snugger fit at the top of your chest. 
Um, so depending on what the clinical need is and if it's uh, edema, I imagine reasonably unlikely, but if it's scarring that you're trying to, to sort of compress here, because this is a very tricky area to provide good compression. That's your, that's the uh, kind of the little stellar tip that you can pull out from your toolbox. Now, axilla, uh, and I apologise that I've got typed up there, new image of Irish axilla. That was a reminder to me to track down the uh, new image from one of our designers, and I uh, obviously omitted that um, because this is a slightly more complicated image. But the way the axilla is constructed in a garment, this is standard here where it looks like an I-shaped piece has been stitched into it. It's a gusset. And that comes in three forms, okay? So one with soft lycra, one with a gusset shape, but no fabric in there, or a gusset with this mesh material, which is quite a lot cooler. But be aware that these two particularly do constitute a reduction of compression in and around the area. So depending on where the edema or the um, scarring is, you'll need to take that into account. The other option is that you request an Irish axilla. And whereas this is a single eye shape piece stitched in there, and you can see that it sort of flattens out, so there's not a lot of compression actually up into the axilla. Whereas here, two sort of C-shaped, crescent moon shapes, they together make the um, gusset. So there's actually two parts to the gusset. And there's a central seam. This is awesome for getting really good compression up into the axilla, particularly if you need good compression on the chest wall or even on the um, medial aspect of the arm right up into the axilla. But if you had, say, breakdown, sensitivity, banding on the anterior of the um, uh, axilla, that seam is an irritant. So I can't honestly tell you that one is better than the other, but I can tell you what the strengths and weaknesses are of each other, and then you can do, make that decision when you prescribe your garment. Another thing, uh, sort of other things to think about with the shoulders, this, the top of your shoulder here, just right over the bulk of the deltoid, this is a sensitive area with the bony prominence just underneath. And um, just as, as an aside, this is a, the male version of the lymph crop vest. So you can see that it's, while it's suitable for breast and chest wall edema, it doesn't look like a bra. Um, but I had a patient who was very, very sensitive over the top of the, the shoulder points here, and that skin was quite fragile. And we ended up replacing this panel with that fabric I mentioned earlier, CDA, because it's smoother and silkier, made a big difference to when he was getting them on and off, those garments on and off. And then this is kind of another little trick that we devised quite a few years ago um, where the your olecranon can be, ve or the skin over your olecranon can be very sensitive. And when you consider the length of an arm sleeve, when we measure an arm sleeve, we measure an arm sleeve when it's length, uh, when it's straight. So the length of the garment is designed to fit when it's straight. Um, so when you bend into, say, full flexion, that longitudinal tension, the friction point really is the shoulder, uh, is the uh, olecranon. And so when um, when there's breakdown occurring, it becomes, it really is a problem pressure point. So the system that we devised with this particular person was that we cut a slit across the garment. Uh, I didn't cut it. I hasten to add it we send it back to the factory uh, for them to cut that and so that when it went on it um it sat above and below the electronon but we obviously didn't want to have great compression here and great compression here and then tissue bulging out there so we made another little sleeveette out of the same material still out of power net that went over the top so there was really good circumferential compression here but when she moved, that sleeve sort of could pull up and down, like down from the top bit, up from the bottom bit, to accommodate that movement so that we didn't get that uh, longitudinal pressure. And that, uh, in fact, solved that problem. So that's another good little trick to sort of file away. Now, 
other problem areas are the um, the flank uh, and the waist, sort of here. Um, and somehow I think my arrows have slipped because it's meant to be the flank here and the waist here. Um, this is the inside of a lymph crop vest, which is designed specifically for breast edema and chest wall edema, and it's lined with CDA. Um, and so there's reinforcement panel there. You can do that for any, it doesn't have to be for breast edema or chest wall edema, but that is a very good way to get compression on the, the, uh, the flank and the, the chest wall here. Now the waist. This is tricky when you or well, you can see from the mannequin and we spoke about concave areas. A waist isn't a concave area, but it behaves just like it because it's narrower circumference there than it is at, say, at um, chest level or at hip level. And so what the fabric wants to do is it either wants to ride up or sit, doesn't sit snugly in the skin. And um, I, I had a patient who'd had very deep debridement here. So her waist was tiny and her hips were relatively quite a bit larger. The waist hip ratio was something like 0.6 or 0.7 maybe. Um, and we put her in a bodysuit because we thought that would work better and measured very carefully and accurately. And when I fitted the bodysuit on her, it looked awesome. And I thought, oh, this is actually going to work. It's sitting really snugly in there. But when she came back about four weeks later and her scarring was very active, it was really apparent that there was not sufficient compression around the waist. So we're really a bit stumped. And in the end, we came up with the most simple solution, which was a basically a belt of five centimetre wide elastic, which you just put, put on over the top. And it then, the compression and the proportion of the garment was exactly right, but it just couldn't exert the right amount of compression because of the way it, the garment wanted to go from the, the shortest points from A to B, i.e. chest to hip. Um, but by putting on that uh, elastic uh, belt, uh, it then enabled the garment to do what it needed to do. Now, here's another little one, and this is common. This is a common problem, and it's, it doesn't only happen here in the malleolus, but it certainly does. This is an absolute great example of this sort of problem of a concave area. So you look there, I, I actually saw a sock that had been measured by a you know, very competent and well-meaning therapist. Measured ankle sock was a beautiful fitting sock, was perfect, apart from the fact the scar was here and there was no compression here because it just kind of tented across from the malleolus to the, to the heel um, because it's going from high point to high point. So we stitched in some foam padding. And in fact, what I have subsequently done for a few patients is I've then had on the skin side, had the Cylon Tex lining stitched onto the foam padding. So we get a double whammy. We get good compression and it's shaped compression so that it's, it actually offloads peak compression on the malleolus so that it, that's not getting irritated. It provides targeting compression behind the malleolus. And then with the silicon there too, it's easy. The patient's not having to put in silicon gel products inside. So it's a good solution. Postural correction, range of different reasons. I mentioned hypermobility spectrum, which of course includes Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Uh, where um, children and adults sometimes need to wear uh, compression suits to um, provide support. Um, and like the child suit on the left is a, provides um, pull into uh, external rotation. And in this one on the right, um, that it's a very commonly used panel, the triangle panel there that is used for um, postural correction, particularly pain, edema, scarring, anything on the front chest. It's our normal response to sort of hunch over and then we start to develop an abnormal posture. But that postural panel on the back encourages the person to be positioned in an upright position in good posture. So prevents abnormal posture and also corrects abnormal posture. So we're getting towards the end now. Oh, we've done. Oh, we've done so much better for time this time around. Um, this is just a case study of the prescription factors coming together. And this um, 
these beautiful champagne legs on the right, that that stippled effect there is nothing to do with any kind of pathology. It's just um, uh, indents, the dimpling from the silicon backed elastic. And this uh, lovely 86 year old woman lives alone in a small unit. Um, and when I first saw her, she had dependent edema and it had progressed so much so that she had leaky legs. So we provided treatment for her to bring the leg volume down, but then we needed to provide her with a good um, option for compression going forward. Now, she had lots of uh, comorbidities, renal insufficiency, OA, she'd had carpal tunnel bilaterally, she'd had a left frozen shoulder, she'd also had traumatic injuries to both shoulders, she was osteoporotic, she had low back pain, She'd had Guillain-Barre, so she had some generalised weakness, uh, depression, and she'd also had a um, left, uh, left CVA, although she didn't have any residual deficits from that. She's in receipt of a care package, which provides assistance with um, showering and dressing, and she, uh, as well as, you know, domestic aid, uh, activities of daily living, and she, whoops, and she ambulates with a four-wheel walker. But... When I looked at her legs, I thought for sure we were going to need to get her into a flat neck garment if we sort of go back to the construction. But there's no way they, she could get them on and off or in fact tolerate that process. So we really needed to look at something that we could modify to give her exactly what she needed. So we provided her with Job Skin Garment. She's been wearing these for quite a few years now and we've sort of got a solution that's just right. She has zips that help with the donning and the doffing but there's no way she could hold those two zips together. She does have carer support most times, but if her carer is not available, we've got a few modifications in the garment that enable her to put them on and off. She's also got these zip fastening aids. If you see those there, they're like little Velcro tabs that you can hold the two parts of the fabric together, Velcro it down, then pull the zip up to that, do the next one up, um, undo the tab, zip up to the next tab so that it holds the two sides of the zips together. She had a zip looper, um, hers in ribbon. She didn't like the leather, she preferred the ribbon, um, which was to enable her to reach the bottom of the zip if she was having to don it herself. Um, we put an anterior ankle gusset in to reduce um, the creasing at the anterior ankle. And that was really a bit of a nod to the way her edema had progressed. We didn't want to allow that to happen again. And we put soft enclosed toes on for comfort and for anchorage. Now, these are really, com it's a soft lycra, almost like a bather's material and or swimmers or cozies if you're um, uh, non-West Aussies. Um, and um, so it's very comfy material so that you don't get the problems with sort of friction on the toes or ingrown toenails, which sometimes happens with more stronger with stronger compression. But the other real bonus is if rather than an open toe garment, which also avoids those things, sometimes open toe garments, they just have a tendency to ride back. It depends on the shape of the foot. But by having the soft enclosed toe, it keeps the garment nice and stable. And then the last thing we did for this uh, lovely lady was we put her into five centimetre silicon backed elastic because remember her legs uh, in the last slide, they were that beautiful champagne shape, which is very difficult to keep garments up for. But with the five centimetre silicon backed elastic, it anchored really nicely for her and it became a very effective garment. So we're on a winning formula with her. So she contacts me periodically and we just do the same old, same old. We don't change the prescription in any way, shape or form because it's working for us. And I think that's a really great example about how when we stop and think and prescribe exactly what's required, then it's a workable solution. So we're getting towards the end, as I say. Um, and just a couple of logistical things for you to be aware of. Some of you have used Job Skin before, some of you may not have. Um, every order has to have that order form plus the relevant measuring form. All the forms are on the website um, and when you can download them from there. When they're completed, you just email the forms to customer.service at jobskin.com and you can ring the customer service at any, I'll just go back 
customer service at any time um, on 03 or for New Zealanders is a plus 61 before that. Uh, 9915 that will get you to the customer service uh, team. And but honestly, we really do. We pride ourselves on this and we genuinely want to be a support for clinicians who are at the coal face. We've developed a significant range of resources, which you'll find under the support and training tab. Um, so all the how to videos, um, all the all the forms, uh, those brochures that I mentioned and more. Uh, and then Veronica and I are available by email, by phone, by, um, you know, telehealth type media, whether it's Zoom or Teams or Skype, and we can either uh, discuss situations with you or we're happy to also um, do a video link up uh, when your patient is present so that can we can troubleshoot together. Um, but as I said earlier, can I commend to you our awesome design team. You, they have a generic email at designers at jobskin.com or they can be reached on a similar number to the customer service, but it's got a five on the end. Uh, that'll get you to the design team. And they are, honestly, they are delighted to work with you to find solutions um, for some of the clinical conundrums you might find yourself in. So we spoke a bit at the start about garments for living. And so just to reiterate what we're aiming for is we're wanting to provide the gar a garment that's the one that's necessary for the clinical condition that is effective, achieves the therapeutic outcomes, that provides a compression where it's needed. It can accommodate varying skin states. It's a good fit and it's livable. Uh, someone's happy to wear it. It provides good sustainable compression. And if the garment can, if you as the prescribing therapist can get the garment that you're prescribing, that's what we would consider a garment for living to be. Now, I know that you uh, are each working in different clinical circumstances. And we did say before the start of this webinar that we're really happy for you to bring any clinical challenges to us so we can have a Q&A session. Uh, we've got plenty of time available for that. So if you've got uh, questions, you can either unmute your mic um, or you can um, type into the chat because Veronica all, uh, is sort of staffing the chat line so to speak and she can um, we can raise those questions and uh, let me just reiterate uh, or reassure you that there's no such thing as a dumb question um, we see all kinds of clinical situations between us Veronica and I and uh, um, we can all learn from any situation that you um, are willing to raise with us. So um, I'm going to uh, hand over to Veronica and uh, if any questions then Veronica um, can um, kind of chair that uh, next segment. All right, over to you Veronica. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, so uh, Karen's okay. just typing something. Thank you, no questions, not a problem. Thanks, Karen. Leah, nice to see you on tonight. Is that Leah from Hobart? It sure is. Ah, hey, Leah. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Oh, it'd probably be, be faster for me to speak than to type. Um, sure. I was really interested in your comments, Rosemary, about the sock and trying to get that compression over the Electronons. Oh, not the Electronons. <laughs> That's oh, right. We know, the, we know the Electronons oh. in the ankle. We know the one. <laughs> um, I just was seeing someone earlier today who's got a burn in that particular area um, and I was also wanting to do the anterior ankle gusset just to help in terms of movement but I'm just worried in terms of how far that would come around to fit with that. Is that has that been a problem in the past no. in terms of fitting the, home? 
Yeah, that's a that's actually a, that's a really good question. Normally, the anterior ankle gusset finishes around at the point of the malleolus. I'm just going to see if I can uh, actually see this. This one's quite wide yeah. here. Yeah. Um, but if you're concerned about that, um, two things. I, I reckon usually it finishes around the malleolus. It doesn't usually go beyond. I suspect it was goes back to our initial specs for this lady. Mm. Um, but I would, I'd put that on the form, and I would say that you don't want it to, in, you, you know, gusset not to intersect with the compression. And I think logically, I think I could safely say on behalf of Anne-Marie and Ellen's and Catalan's behalf that they they wouldn't actually uh, bring it round that far because it then makes it mm. hideously complicated. <laughs> we do have a standard gusset size, but when there is complicating things like you're adding in a zip or like the padding that you're talking about or um, at therapist's request if the particular scar um, finishes in in a certain area and you really want to move the seaming away from that then absolutely it is adaptable mm. yeah yep. yeah and I want to mirror what you said about the designers Anne-Marie is fabulous mm. I'm often on the phone to her and problem solving and a lot of the little tips and things that you've talked about in terms of the concavity of the palm or just done some gloves with some inserts for foam and they just work tremendously oh awesome that's so good to hear yeah yeah and uh, i've just even while while this webinar <laughs> you know um, I, I think our dependence on working with the design team will never end. Um, you know, just while I've been um, running this webinar, this uh, my emails popped up, an email popped up from Anne Marie, just you know, troubleshooting uh, the the latest design scenario that I put to her. So, yeah, they're pretty yeah. awesome. Yeah, yeah, and thanks, thanks for that compliment, Lee. I'll, I'll we'll pass that on to um, the team. Fantastic. One other thing, sorry, just while well, you've got me. No, do it. <laughs> it's all yours. Um, I've got a very, I've got a, diff, well, not a difficult lady, but I've got a challenging situation with a lady who's probably in her 70s and she's got at the moment, well, she's had diabetes for a long time, but they're quite unstable at the moment and she's got burns across the top of her foot almost to the anterior ankle um, and then also across both the top and underneath of all her toes and she's had some yeah. grafting done yeah i'm fairly hesitant to put her into anything much at the moment but also quite cautious um, that those areas are going to be problematic in terms of scarring and it already feels quite thick they're not quite healed and it's been at least four weeks now. Wow. So I'm just wondering, um, you know, she got this from having her feet in hot water. So I don't know if she's got a peripheral neuropathy diagnosis, but I suspect she probably does based on her lack of awareness that her feet was burning in this hot water, um, which yeah. caused the burn. And I just wondered if you had any thoughts around that and use of compression is it okay that i watch and wait for a bit longer and i i am um, um that, that that's one of those good clinical you know mm. conundrums i think um when you have that um when you have that sort of situation any way that you can keep your compression therapeutic but offload risk um, gives you, uh, you know, that's that's what you're really aiming to do because, um, and sometimes you do have to watch and wait till you and evaluate that. And you, um, and I know you know this, but like elderly people, theoretically, they're supposed to have less of an issue with scarring mm -hmm. because their skin's less, you know, there's less collagen in the skin. Yeah. But honestly, I've seen some older people with just, you know, thick, hard, intractable scarring. And I reckon a good option is to go for like an open toe, knee high or anklet, whichever's more suitable, obviously, mm -hmm. um, and then use it in combination with a open toed toe piece. Mm. Because if it's open toed, 
it can be closed toed, but not as long as it's not to make sure that your measurements aren't too short. Um, it uh, it offloads that 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 um, uh, it's not downward pressure like that backward pressure that causes so many problems over the tips of the toes when there's neuropathies there because that's oftentimes ingrown toenails. Um, uh, you know, clawing of the toes. Clawing of the toes and that, uh, and also that risk when there's compromised sensation. Yep. Um, you can get good circumferential compression with a like a toe piece, like a toe glove. Yep. And if you, if depending on the person, you can either ha have a toe piece that you wear under an open toed um, ankle sock or you can put a sling back on. Yep. I've become quite a good fan of the sling back mm -hmm. because it just um, it just keeps everything so stable. I would totally say that was the immediate design that I went to as well, Rosemary. And I'd be tempted. I would be um, almost set on going open toes, not only to get the fit back into the web spaces, mm. but also because you're concerned she has a peripheral yes. neuropathy. Yes. So you need to be able to monitor those toes because she clearly doesn't have yeah. the sensation to be able to notice when things aren't right herself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I also think by doing the combination of the two garments, it means that, you know, you've sort of identified that there is delays in healing and that there may be ongoing problems with, um, you know, rubbing or breakdown. And by having it as two different parts, it means that you can apply in one part and remove from another part, depending on what's happening from a wound or rubbing perspective. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks for your questions, Leah. Yeah, that was a really good question. <laughs> I'm sure I'll have more next week. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, ladies. It was lovely to hear from you. Well, Adam, I don't know if we want to wind this up. I'm on mute, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yeah. No, um, thank you all for coming to the webinar. Um, please go to our website, which I will post a link of in the chat for the next one. Uh, and then we hope to see you next time. So the next webinar will be on the... 28th of April. 28th of April. And the topic would be compression for scar management. So we hope to see you all there. Cool. Other than that, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, team. Bye.